what you've got in every little thing will be all right you've got the best for me trust you with everything you've got in oh i don't need to worry about anything i put it in your hands let go of my plans you've got in oh every little thing will be all right you've got the best for me trust you with everything All right, good morning. Welcome to Risen Church. How are we doing this morning? Everyone feeling okay? All right, if you're in the hallway, if you will join us here in the sanctuary, we are about to begin our time of worship, worshiping the risen Lord Jesus here this morning. My name is Sean, one of the pastors here. Grateful that y'all are here to worship with us. A couple of opportunities to engage with us as a body I want to let y'all know about. The first is we are bringing back our prayer services. So prayer services are returning. That will be March the 9th. And so I want to mark y'all's calendar for the prayer service. It's going to be a great time. We're gathering at Northway Church just up the road. Pastor Rodney, whom we love there, has opened up their building for us to gather and pray together as a church. So we're going to have a time of worship and prayer and reflection on God's word midweek. So uh, mark your calendar for that. Look for more details on our website. If you're not signed up for our newsletter, that would be a great opportunity to uh, jump onto risennorth.org and make sure your email's in there so you can know about all the happenings here with us as a local gathering. Also, the women of the church, the women are doing a women's equip class and that will be beginning uh, March the 27th. It's a three-week class that uh, the women of the church are gonna be walking through the women of the Old Testament, I think three different Old Testament characters. And so they'll be gathering before church in one of the rooms here uh, before our worship service. And so we are asking for registration for the women uh, equip class. So make sure you jump on risennorth.org and get registered for that. If you're a woman here and want to participate in the equip class. Also, we're having another church-wide picnic that same day on the 27th. So immediate, so women, you'll have a full day of uh, Old Testament study, worship, and then right after, go church-wide picnic. So we're doing that at Shadow Bend Park again, where we normally uh, gather for our church-wide picnics. And it's just kind of bring your own lunch, uh, bring some friends and gather, and we're going to have some footballs, and the, the kids are running around playing, and we just gather for a chance to share a meal together and to slow down. Uh, it's a little bit hectic here sometimes after church, tearing chairs down and flipping this and turning this back into a dance studio, but we'll get to go over and uh, just sit and enjoy some fellowship and some time uh, together on the 27th. So lots coming up. Like I said, jump on our website and find out more about all these opportunities to get registered for those. Hey, would you stand with me as I open with the reading of God's word? Psalm 86 says this, Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly. Save your servant who trusts in you, you are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I do lift my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you and you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great, and you do wondrous things, and you alone are God. Let's worship him this morning, church. In the morning I'll sing you I 
It can 
never be tainted it can never be broken this is our confession this is our conviction we believe what is written we believe what you've spoken though christ was dead now surely he's risen yeah he's coming back again in christ will reign in triumph forever yeah all praise belongs to him yeah all praise belongs to jesus we've got a reason to praise this morning because we were once a people far off but we've been brought near we were once dead, we've been made alive. Once in bondage, we've been set free. So this morning, with our loudest praise, we give Jesus what he's worthy of. He's our redeemer, he's our savior, and he's coming back for us. So let's sing this. Oh, sing hallelujah, cause Christ is our Christ is our Redeemer and shout hallelujah. Oh, Jesus holds our future. Though Christ was dead, now surely with us and I pray that you came in with an expectancy to hear from God and to hear from the Holy Spirit and it is my prayer that you're standing on that truth that Jesus holds not only our future but he's with us in in the present um, he's actively speaking to us he he told his disciples that he's leaving his spirit and that it was better um, and you know we, I don't think that's I think that's hard for us to understand like well what could be better than physically walking with Jesus uh, but his spirit within us is, has an even more closeness um, than the disciples even got to experience because we can, we wake up with the Holy Spirit. We wake up uh, 
with the wisdom of God, with the same power that rose Christ from the dead is, is living and active in me. And it's not really a, it's something that's not, you know, easily grasped, um, but it's true. Uh, I think I take for granted the fact that the Holy Spirit gives me wisdom in a conversation or wisdom in how to speak to a friend or uh, how to speak to a family member, a coworker. He's constantly with us, guiding us, keeping us. And he's in the room today. It's not this mystic thing. It's a, a real tangible thing. If you came in today and if you are a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. So God's presence is physically here. He's, he promises to be with us when we gather and he's with us when we're separated. So how much more powerful is it for us to come together and to lift praise and to um, be unified in the spirit? So I just, in these next few moments, I just pray that we would become aware of that. We would just tune into the fact that the Holy Spirit is, is ready and willing to speak to you right now. He is ready and willing to give comfort to give correction, guidance, clarity. He's near and he's close. God is not far off. We don't have to scream loud enough so that he can hear us and that he would answer our prayer. He's, he's still and he's small and he's with us today. So let our praise of him just be an outpouring of that truth. We welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives, not because he's not here, but we welcome him. We, we acknowledge that we're making space in our hearts, in our minds to hear from him. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this space this morning. God, we pray that you would just come and do what only you can do. Come and move and speak in a way that only you can in a way that we just have no question or doubt in our mind that we've heard from you. You are the giver of love and peace and wisdom and all things good. And we thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nothing was more that could ever come close. No thing can come back. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. You're all we need. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of lambs when my heart becomes free and my shame is under your presence Lord. Holy Spirit you are welcome come fly Tasted and seen of the sweetest. 
As a ritual, we don't come in this place as a habit, but we truly come in each and every week expectant, expectant for you to move. God, our hearts are open to hear from you. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. He's in the room. In his presence, there's the fullness of joy. There's peace forevermore. When you consider who God is and where he is, I pray that you are feeling his presence right now and that in this space, you are experiencing the freedom that can only come from being with our creator. And that's the reason why we gather. 
my heart oftentimes feels full and heavy all at the same time because my heart's desire is that we would not just sing these songs, but that we would be able to live these truths. And so as we prepare to spend time in the Word of God today, I pray that whatever was happening throughout this past week, things that may have been burdening you, things that may have been troubling you, that for these moments that we have come together to worship our God together, that we would experience his freedom, his peace, and his joy, that our ears would be open, our hearts attentive to who God is and what he's doing in our lives. If you've been with us for any amount of time this year, you know that we're in the book of Exodus and we're going to be walking through the book of Exodus for some time. And it's been a beautiful time as we have seen God introduce himself to his servant Moses, make himself known to his people and making himself known to those who would oppress his people. And if there was a theme for this first third of the book of Moses that we're going through, is the reminder that God is a personal God who makes himself known. If you are his people, that brings you great joy. If you are not his people, that should spark fear and terror enough to make you want to be his people. And so as we're going through this word today, I pray that that's at the forefront of our mind, that we have a God who loves us and who would make himself known. Because if that's at the forefront of our mind, the question that I'll pose even on the front end is how do we respond? May we wrestle with that well on this morning. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, we come humbly before your throne of grace, believing that you are a God who is personal, who makes himself known to his people. And how grateful we are that you would visit with us, that you would speak to us, that you would love on us. And so, Lord, as we are aware of your presence in this space, we pray that you would speak to our hearts. A word that would train, teach, correct, rebuke, a word that will help us to continue to endure to the end, to hold on to your love to experience your joy, your freedom, your peace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. Then the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. And they did so. Aaron stretched out his hand with his staff and struck the dust of the earth. And there were gnats on man and beast. All the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magicians said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. This is the word of the Lord. It's good all by itself. As I've shared, we've been walking through the book of Exodus, and in order to appreciate this third plague as we refer to it, we have to be reminded of what's happening in this story. So I'm going to go back to chapter 5 and do a Hubble telescope overview of chapters 5 through 8, the first half of chapter 8, just so that we can really appreciate and see what the magicians are proclaiming and how that should challenge and charge us today. So going back to Exodus chapter 5, Moses Again, just fast forward 
has an introduction with the Lord and in obedience to the Lord after some conversation and conviction, he makes his way to Egypt. He goes to see Pharaoh with his brother Aaron to let them know the command of God, let my people go. And so Moses here now with Aaron in front of Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? that I should obey his voice and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Now, what we have to understand in this picture, what's happening in this day, in this time period, if a king was looking to conquer another kingdom, they would have sent an advance party with some commands, some demands to pay some tribute, to do some things. And if you did not do these things, then get ready to pay the price because we're coming in with our army. And so here is Moses, the advanced party, letting Pharaoh know that the God of the Hebrews has sent him and has made a demand, let my people go. And so if a king, in hearing some demands from another king, was to pay this tribute, and they said, I'm not paying that tribute. I'm a more powerful kingdom. Well, then a battle would ensue. But if that king knew that they had no chance, it's like, do you want a little bit extra? Just uh, let me know what you need because we're just trying to live. We're just trying to make it. We don't want any problems. You got it. Right? So Pharaoh's response is not, oh, well, I never heard of this Lord. No, his response Why would I do what he commanded? No. Our gods are more powerful. I'm more powerful. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice, that I should meet his demands, that I should pay his tribute, that I should let our entire workforce for the past few centuries now just stroll on out to the wilderness because they want to worship? Yeah, well, I want them to build some buildings. Absolutely not. I refuse to participate. Not only am I not going to let them go, I'm going to make life worse for them. And that's what's happening here. So Pharaoh, again, you got to go back and either listen to some of the sermons, read over the chapters. Pharaoh refuses. He makes life miserable. The people of Israel said, you know what? Forget it. Not wanting to do anything with it. Moses is like, "Um, I'm about done with it as well. The Lord steps in. I'm I'm talking about this is astronaut level high overview. Moses has some more conversations and convincing, and Moses now, for another opportunity, finds himself going to stand in front of Pharaoh because God said, I'm not done. Go back and let Pharaoh know. Let my people go. And the Lord lets Moses know how this is going to play out. Chapter 7, looking at verse 4, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. So now the Lord is letting it be known to his servant Moses, I'm going to do some great acts of judgment. And these great acts of judgment are going to let the Egyptians know that I am the Lord. In other words, it's going to let Pharaoh know why he should listen to me and do what I command, meet my demands or else. So I'm going to prove who I am, I am the Lord, and you should listen. And so that's what the great acts of judgment are going to demonstrate to Pharaoh, why you should listen to the Lord. And so the Lord lets Moses know you're going to go back. And he's going to tell you to prove yourself, prove that you are, in fact, a servant of the God of the Hebrews and why I should listen to you. And the Lord tells Moses, when he tells you to do that, throw the staff on the ground and become a snake. That's going to be the sign, the miracle that he'll know that you've been sent by the Lord, the God of the Hebrews. And maybe that'll help him to listen. But it doesn't because Pharaoh, the scriptures tell us, verse 11, summoned his wise men and his sorcerers, the magicians... Now, we have to understand these magicians are like the UN of false gods, right? It's just a bunch of representatives of the pantheon of gods that Egypt worships. And so he calls these servants of the false gods in, and they do the same thing by their secret arts. And so, in other words, what these magicians are doing is they're letting Pharaoh know, you don't need to listen. 
See, our gods can do the same thing. They're just as powerful. You don't need to meet those demands. And so Pharaoh sees this. His heart is hardened. He refuses to listen. And that's what the Lord lets Moses know in verse 14. Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. And then God tells Moses what he's to do. Go let Pharaoh know this is how it's going down. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. So this is going to be a sign. This is the first act of judgment so that Pharaoh might know that this is the Lord and he should listen. Right, But we see as we continue reading in the passage, Pharaoh calls these servants of these false gods and they perform the same, not really to that level at all, but the same sign. And Pharaoh's heart is hardened. See, our God can do the same thing. We don't need to listen to them. Don't meet those demands. Just just keep on going. So Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He keeps on going. And the Lord says, go back, Moses. I mean, God, you want to talk about stubborn. God just has no movement. When he says a thing, he's going to do exactly what he says. Go back, Moses. I'm not deterred or moved at all by this. Let Pharaoh know. Chapter 8, verse 1. Thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. If you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. And the frogs just keep on coming. And Pharaoh calls his magicians in again. And now they, these servants of these false gods, are looking and saying, "Ah, look at this. We can get frogs, too. I was talking with my daughter the other day, and she's like, did they really produce frogs? I mean, there were so many. Did they really just like, oh, grab a frog and just throw it out? I don't know how they did it, but there were a lot of frogs. Why are you going to produce more? They produce more. Pharaoh's not moved by it, but there are so many frogs now. We see Pharaoh starting to waver a waffle just a little bit. Like, man, these are a lot of frogs. (laughs) Like, can you please? I mean, I'm... Just ask the frogs to stop coming, right? And so, okay, when? Tomorrow. That's another thing we got to unpack another day. But for some reason, Pharaoh's like, right now, like tomorrow, what are you thinking? So he says, tomorrow, and Moses says to him, verse 10 of chapter 8, be it as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God, so that you may know that I am the Lord and you will listen to me and meet my demands. So God does what he says. And then there's a respite and Pharaoh refuses to listen. And now, chapter 8, verse 16 and 17, we see that the Lord gives a different plan to Moses and Aaron. This time, there's no command. There's no demand. They do not go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And if you refuse, no, they just say, Moses, Aaron, stick out your staff, hit the dust, the gnats are coming. And the reason why this slight alteration in the conversation between the servants of God and Pharaoh is because God is going to prove himself. I am the Lord. You may want to listen up. And so we see in verse 18, the magicians tried by their secret arts to produce the gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. So here again now, for what would have been the fourth time, Pharaoh calls these servants of these false gods to come in and to disprove that this God is worth listening to. But they couldn't do it. They could not produce the gnats. And so now what we'll see is the magicians have an answer to Pharaoh's initial question. Who is the Lord that I should listen to him? Uh, Pharaoh? He's, he's a god. Yes, I mean, just, we got nothing for you. We're trying. <clears throat> Like, it's just not happening. I mean, they, they could not do it. And so then the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. This is an act of God. We cannot make this sign happen. We're at a loss. 
So we have to acknowledge that this is a God. Now understand, they're not professing that this is the true and living, the one and only God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. No, what they're saying is, hey, if our list was 80, I think we need to bump it up to 81. And based on the way he's beaten the snot out of us, we probably want to list him in the top 10, maybe even the top three. Like he is a God. In other words, we may want to listen to him. But we see Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refused to listen, even though God continues to prove himself and make himself known. Now, when you consider what the magicians are doing, though, the magicians are magnifying the name of the Lord. They're singing the praises of our God. Because they see what's happening. They can't deny it. They've tried those other times and they made some things work. Even though, I mean, again, if you're in your right mind, you're like, all right, I made a pool, a bowl maybe of water turn. But they, the whole Nile, like we got that. I mean, we should have said that from day one. But they didn't. But now they are. They're singing God's praise. And the source of their praise is what's happening. And as you think about the magicians, we, like the magicians, should magnify the name of the Lord and sing his praise. But the difference is the source of our praise. You see, the psalmist, Psalm 95 Many biblical scholars believe that it was King David that wrote the psalm. In thinking of this very time period, the time of the Exodus, when God made himself known to his people and by great acts of judgment freed them from Egypt and then was walking with them through the wilderness to the promised land, communicates this very thought. We should be a people of praise, but not because of what's happening, but because of who God is. And that's what we see here as King David remembers this time period. Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7a. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. He's our God. We know who he is. And so for that reason, the psalmist says, sing songs of praise because our God is a great God, a king above all gods. He's number one. And in fact, if you want to list 80, they don't make it on his list. He is the one and only God. And we should sing songs of praise as the people of God. But it's not just because of how powerful he is. It's also because of how personal he is. For he is our God and we are his sheep When you stop and consider this mind-blowing truth, you mean to tell me the great creator of all things would call me his people? Would consider me to be the sheep of his pasture? I mean, again, think about it. The sheep of his pasture. That means that he's providing for all the needs of those who would consider themselves to be his people. He's got you. 
And if we understand this, then we don't only sing his praise, we are a people of praise. And that's what the psalmist says, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. This picture communicates submission, surrender. Not only do I acknowledge that you are the great God, the king above all gods, but I will submit to you as my king. I will bow down before you. I will bend the knee. I will worship you. I will praise you continually because you're my God. You're my Lord. See, the source of our praise is different than the magicians. They were praising God because of what was happening. That's a lot of gnats, and we can't do anything with them. We praise him because of who he is, and that looks different. And so the psalmist, again, considering this time period, goes on a little bit further to give a warning to the people of God to make sure that their worship doesn't waver. And so if we continue on reading the rest of the psalm, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, and hardening your hearts simply means Do not refuse to listen to God like Pharaoh did. Do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of at Massah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their heart. And they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, listen, if you're not familiar with the Maribah or Masa, then it's like, well, what in the world is he talking about like in that day? So I'm going to just jump over to Exodus 17. We're going to get there in a few weeks and unpack it in greater detail. But for right now, again, just high level so that we can understand what the psalmist is warning us as the people of God from doing. I want to just make sure that we're up to speed what was happening in this place that the psalmist referenced. So again, high level overview. The children of Israel, the acts of judgment have all been performed. They have left Egypt. Parted the sea, they're on the other side. They've seen the Lord turn bitter water into good water for them to drink. They've seen the Lord provide manna from heaven. They've seen the Lord provide. And now they get to this place in the wilderness. They got some questions. Here, verse 17, 1 through 3. All the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages. According to the commandment of the Lord. They're moving in, a, in obedience to the Lord and camp at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore, the people quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. And Moses said to them, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? Now, again, we have to remember that this is, these are summaries of what was going on. So Moses likely did not just ask these two questions. He was passionately looking to remind them of who God was and inquire, don't, don't, don't put God to the test, right? So in summary, that was the question that he's asking. But the people thirsted there for water. And the people grumbled against Moses and said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst. Now, again, we'll get there later on the week. The Lord sends Moses up the mountain at Horeb, and he strikes rock, water comes down, the people are drinking good. But there's still a problem that needs to be addressed. Verse 7, And he called the name of the place Masa and Meribah. Meribah meaning quarreling, and Masa meaning testing. Because the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us or not? Remember, this is the God who made himself known. He's personal. He introduced himself to the children of Israel. They know who he is and they know where he is. I didn't even mention yet and I just 
feel like I'm rushing through it because I really want to sit in it a little bit longer. But there's a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. The presence of God is with the people. Again, remember back a few weeks ago, we talked about it, that the Lord gave this name as a memorial for the people to remember him by, that he is the eternally existent, personally present God who makes good on his promises. And now they're saying, is the Lord among us or not? What? Did you forget the 10 plagues? Maybe? Or what about the walls of water that we just walk by. Look at the fish. Like, you're walking through a fish bowl. It's like, what, did you? You're eating daily bread that just appears. Is the Lord among us or not? What happened? Well, the psalmist says where they went wrong. They had seen the works of God. But verse 10, he says, they have not known my ways. See, their praise, the source of their praise was the same as the source of the praise of the magicians. What's happening? Oh, those are a lot of gnats. We can't do anything with that. This is the finger of God. Okay, so what you going to do with that? Well, let the children of Israel go so they can worship. No, we still got seven more plagues to unpack and I'm looking forward to them. Right. They continue to worship their God. They just said, okay, we may need to add a God to the list, but we still aren't going to do what God says to do. So they needed another sign and another sign and another sign. They were just chasing out the signs. And Jesus says, it's an adulterous generation that looks for a sign. When you have the true and living God right here, right now. What more of a sign that you need than the Son of God putting on flesh? Hello? <clears throat> no, but okay, but I mean, yeah, no, nah, I hear what you're saying, but can you just prove it? I mean, how many more plagues? How many more signs do we need? Signs will never save you. Listen. Because like the children of Israel... We put God to the test. We call on him and say, if you do X, Y, and Z, then, if you pro prove yourself to me, and then I'll serve you. Make that happen. Give me this, and then I'll give you my worship. No, the psalmist is making it very clear because of who he is, the all-powerful God who's personally present we worship him. If he doesn't do another thing, he's already done enough. See, if we keep chasing signs, we'll miss our Savior. But if we come to know who he is, it doesn't matter what we're going through. We are a people of praise, and he's a God who's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. What do you do when you find yourself in a situation that looks really bad? I know what's happening, but I know who he is. And so I'm not going to change my praise because of this problem. See, when you praise God because of signs... Your praise is circumstantial, and then it's inconsistent. But when you praise God because of who he is, your praise is continual, and it makes a difference in your life and in the life of those around you. We are called to be a people of praise, and we should not let the magicians magnify our God more than we do. He saved us from sin, death, and the grave. I don't need him to do another thing. I know that it looks bad, but God, you don't have to prove yourself to me. I know who you are. I know your ways. You will not live for a God that you do not love. You will not love a God that you do not know. The most important thing that we can do is get to know him. Get to know your creator, the lover of your soul. It will change your life. Homeless, jobless going through, but I know. I know the one who has the depths of the earth in his hands. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea, he's got it. 
and he's formed the dry land. This is God. I mean, when you, I just, sometimes I feel something in me where I just wanted to put a hole through the ground. Says, he's God. What do we do? Walking around here whimpering like, oh, they just keep on picking on me. You've got God on your side. If he's allowing you to go through that, it's because he wants to prove himself to others through you. But he's already got you covered. Right? We should be emboldened to live a life that demonstrates that God is great. And I don't need to wait for the outcome. I'm going to praise him right now. Michael, that looks silly. You didn't even get the job yet. I don't need the job. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You start counting them and let me know when I should start worrying because we might run out of meat. <clears throat> I'm still waiting. Right. We've got God. He's our God. I need just two people to catch that today. That's it. Because if two of us grab a hold of that, the woodlands is in trouble. We're going to start walking through. Don't try to walk through a wall. But I'm just saying, like, we're going to just trust God for all kinds of things. Oh, Lord, you want to build a building? Well, we don't got no money, but you've got God. Lord, you just walking with us through the wilderness? Like, you do know it's the wilderness. <clears throat> yeah, but we've got God. Some of you need to put that on a coffee mug. I mean, the way that you all drink coffee probably would help you to remember. You know, we've got God. <clears throat> right? That's our mantra. That's our call. That's our cry. I've got God. And when we know his ways, our praise doesn't change. Listen, you say, Michael, that's easy for you to say because you live in, in the woodlands, kind of. <clears throat> but I want to just take us to a picture of a person that prays. And I pray that this challenges us all. I'm going to read from Acts. I want to read more of it, but I'm going to read a little less. Start at verse 20, Acts 16. And when they had brought them, Paul and Silas, to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews, and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. Remember that. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he, the jailer, put them, Paul and Silas, into the inner prison. And fasten their feet in the stocks. You all aren't going anywhere. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened. And everyone's bonds were unfastened. You get excited about that back end. But think about where Paul and Silas are. They're in the middle of an already murky situation. Been beaten with many blows and not bandaged. So they're bloody, they're bruised, and they're feeling all kinds of aches and pains. And their feet are locked in. And about midnight, when you can't see your hand in front of your face, they begin to commune with their creator and sing songs of praise. They are in the middle of a prison, and it didn't change their praise because their situation did not cause them to forget their Savior. I don't need to be in the palace to give God praise. He's God. And he's worthy in the middle of a murky situation, feet bound, body beaten, battered and bruised. If I can open my mouth, I'm going to proclaim his praise. And others who just don't understand it are going to be listening 
and wondering what in the world you're right. It's a piece that makes absolutely no sense. You got to try him out for yourself. When you know his ways, where you are doesn't change your praise. Where do you find yourself today? And how do you find yourself responding? If you're a believer in Christ, he doesn't have to prove another thing to you. He's already done enough. He's rescued you from sin, death, and the grave. It's a sad state, family, for the children of God to be curmudgeons. It's a sad state for the children of God to be complaining. I'm going to touch on it. I'm going to hop off it, and we're going to pray. But this is where the Lord was meeting me this week. Michael, if you're going to be a person of praise, you cannot be a person who complains. You can't do both. You cannot sing the praises of a great God who takes care of his people and speak about how you're frustrated and bothered about how employees are doing this or how this is not coming together and this is not. Hold on, Michael. Did you profess that you believe that God is sovereign? Now, when you said that you believe that God is in control over all things and that he is your God and that he has provided a pasture where he's caring for you, uh, did you just mean the 99% of your life and this one area is, is just God is not present? Or do you believe that you have a God who, for reasons that we can't fully understand, would allow you to be sold into slavery, put into prison, and lied and cheated on and all of these things so that his glory might manifest in you and through you? Do you believe him? They're good stories to read, aren't they? I love the story of Joseph, one of my favorite. I just don't want to live it out. (laughs) Moses, great man of God. I'm glad he had to do it. No, God's calling you, and he's calling me to it as well. He's calling us to be a people that praise him in prison. He's calling us to be a people that praise him in pain. He's calling us to be a people that magnify his name because of who he is. Anybody can be happy when everything is going well, but we praise him when everything looks like it's falling apart. And the people listening will wonder, something's different about that group. They're strange. Like they're in the middle of the same pandemic, but they have peace. Yeah, because we've got God. And when I know his ways, I don't need a sign. He's proven himself. Has he proven himself to you today? If he has, then you have a charge and you have a challenge to praise your God. I want to invite the praise team back up. We're going to take a few moments. I know for many of us, this is our favorite time in the, in the sermon where we get to sit with God for a moment. See, because if we believe what we just sang, that the Holy Spirit is in this place and he's speaking to our hearts, then you and I have to do something with what the Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts. And I don't want to release us from that just yet. I don't want you to move on too quickly. I want you to ask yourself a question. What is it that you're giving your praise to? See, because complaining is a form of praise. You're giving your attention, your affection to something or someone else. My praise goes to the only wise, all-powerful, all-present creator of the universe. And I understand that it's something to wrestle with. Again, I told you the Lord has been challenging me and convicting me. Then if you love me, Michael, and you know me, you need to stop complaining about that. And if you talk to anybody that knows me, I mean, for real knows me, they would tell you, Michael, you're not even a complainer. But what do you do when you get into the presence of the holy? Compare yourself to somebody else or do you recognize that I thought that I was maybe off-white? I mean, not completely like just white as snow, but I'm off-white. Especially next to your dark sheet. Is it? I'm getting closer. But when you get into the presence of the holy, like, oh, I'm a man of unclean lips. Surrounded by people. Like, I don't even come close to touching the holiness of God. Father, forgive me. It doesn't matter how small it is. 
doesn't matter how big it is. Father, forgive me for giving my attention and affection to something or someone other than you after you've proven yourself to me. I choose to praise you. Do you make that choice today? If so, consider what you've been complaining about. No matter how small it may be or how big. No guilt or shame. We're not comparing it to somebody else. We're taking it to the Lord. And may we go to God with repentance in our heart. Say, say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for regulating our relationship to performance and telling you to prove yourself. I've come to know your ways. I want to be a person of praise, not have circumstantial praise. So for just a few minutes, you and Jesus get no guilt, no shame, no embarrassment. But just don't leave here complaining. Don't leave here murmuring and grumbling like they did at the Meribah and Massa, asking if God is even among us. Oh, he's here. And he knows where you are. And he's got you. And you've got God. Let's go before this great God for just a few moments. And then I'll close out our time in prayer. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Father, we acknowledge that you are the true and living, the one and only God. We've heard your voice. We will not harden our hearts. We will listen. We will trust. We will obey. Thank you for being a God who loves us and who meets us at the point of our need. And a God who graciously calls us out of places that we don't belong and into your loving presence. Even though we are not worthy, thank you for the blood that you would see us in Christ and call us sons and daughters. So with this revelation, with this truth, we proclaim to be a people of praise. We will worship you because of who you are and not simply what's happening. It's in the matchless name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand with me. We're going to sing another song of praise. <clears throat> And while we're singing that song of praise, if you need prayer, we have some elders in the back that would love to meet with you, touch and agree with you, pray over you. If you find yourself in a hard space, 
you do not have to go alone. God has raised up some loving leaders that will graciously and lovingly walk with you. If you're in a space where you can sing praise to God, listen, church, don't let the magicians magnify your God more than you. May our praise be a thunderous cry proclaiming who our God is. He's worthy. Let us praise him with our life. And may that be reflected in our voices in this hour. Let's praise him, church. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound Entrenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Because of his life and his death, we praise him. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God, oh praise His name forevermore, for endless days we will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. But then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. We'll trample death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, and no oh, praise the Yes, we pray. 
grace. Sing holy and holy, holy are you. I just pray that every breath you put in our lungs, we would just give it right back to you because you're worthy of it. All things are from you. All things are for you. God, we trust that. We believe that. Help us to believe it when it feels like things aren't going our way. It's not about us. It's about who you are and who you always have been, who you always will be. And because of that, God, no matter our circumstance, we can worship you. We can praise you. So God, we believe that in this place. Help us believe it as we walk out of this place. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Church, let's close the reading of God's word. Psalm 86, I opened with it. We're going to close with it. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord. Nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name, and I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. Church, as you go, let's go knowing that he has called us to walk in his truth, that we may glorify his name forever and ever. And church, one last thing as we leave, uh, we have uh, an elder and some folks that want to gather and pray for what's going on around the globe, for our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine, for Christians who are being persecuted. And I believe they're going to grab a room uh, over here to the side when we leave, when the kids class gets out. So if you have a heart to want to intercede and pray for what's going on in our in, uh, in the world, for Christians who are being persecuted, for people who are in suffering would encourage you to um, maybe go over in the hallway in the room and that class lets out and just and pray uh, and pray for what's going on and intercede for our brothers and sisters around the world and what's going on church we love you walk in the truth and his grace this week we'll see you next week y'all take care